yeah, so I just wanted to talk about PIP, what I learned. I obviously had some help as well, which I'd say you need some help with it. And, and somebody that's got empathy with our condition. Um, just to give you a bit of background about um, my sort of background again, so you can sort of understand where I'm coming from with my PIP. So I was um, a senior manager in local government. I've only ever worked in local government. I had a large team of people and I had a large budget. I have two uh, very active uh, boys who were always at football, scouts, etc. And I lived life at 150 mile an hour. I had two tonic clonic seizures in February 19. So I'm still quite new in the journey compared to a lot of people that I know. Um, I had two tonic clinic seizures on the settee one Saturday morning um, and don't really remember much for the next two weeks um, of that. They found a cavernova in my right uh, temporal lobe, uh, too deep to do anything. So it's a case of let's get on with life. I had my third uh, seizure in June last year and I'm still trying to get the right medication. I'm still having seizures. Um, when somebody told me in February 19 that it would take over a year, I was like, no, no, I need to get back to work. I need to drive. That's just ridiculous. And obviously, this is where we are 18 months on. Um, can barely remember the conversation I had with the boys this morning, hence my script today. So that was a little bit about me. And obviously, PIP is about impact on your life. And I think a lot of people out there think, I've either had surgery or I'm okay now. And I think people need to understand that PIP's there to help us. It's not means tested. It doesn't matter what else is going on in your life. But it's about the impact. So obviously, my impact is I have alarms on my phone for everything. I had an alarm on my phone this morning for this, so I didn't forget to do it. I have alarms for lunchtime, uh, medication, all those things that we just used to take for granted that we just used to do. I applied for PIP very early on in the process, uh, May last year, so I'd only been diagnosed a few months and again, it's because I found a buddy on the Carvanova Alliance site. I live in Doncaster and I found somebody in Sheffield and they were five years into their journey. So they'd gone through a whole load of processes. And I found that really useful because again, I think I was in denial about what was happening. So I sent off for the form. It came, and as people know, it's 48 pages long. Um, and I was just like, no, no, I don't need to do this. I'm glad I did. And I think, again, it's taking it in stages. You get the document and you sit down and you read through it with someone, again, that knows where we're coming from, which, again, is quite rare out there, which is why the Alliance, I think, uh, are so important and so important moving forward. So I, I filled out the documents, sent it off, um, and I had her home assessment um, later on in, in May last year. And um, I was too, I think in the home assessment, I was too honest. I think I put on, I put on this front like I do for, <coughs> for the children, and I had a long chat with the assessor. But luckily, the assessor had some knowledge about neurological issues and I think asked the right questions for, to get it out of me what she needed to know. And I scored eight on the standard living allowance, so have that, and I scored 12 on mobility. Now, some people might think, great, that's great. But I think and are still fighting that I should have enhanced daily allowance just because I don't think I can function as well as I should. Um, so, of course, you get the assessment, you get it back, and you can go um, for the next stage. So I did that again, sort of May, June time last year. And all this process just takes so long. And I think, again, 
it's to deter people from doing it. So I didn't get the reconciliation documents till September last year. And again, it was just, we agree with everything, um, you can't have anything else. Again, I took advice from other people in the same situation and I decided to appeal and go to tribunal, which sounds very daunting um, to go to Sheffield Court and, and answer questions about yourself. And obviously the coronavirus uh, came along um, and I applied in September and they said it could take up to a year before you get a date. And I got a date two weeks ago from my tribunal on a conference call over the phone with a judge, a doctor and somebody from DWP. We started the conversation and it became apparent that all parties didn't have the 152 page document of all the evidence. So it was adjourned. So presumably now I wait another six months before I go back to tribunal. My PIP is due in May next year anyway. Um, so who knows what, what may or may not happen. But all the way through this process, it's about sticking to it and remembering the core things about PIP and about the impact on you, your family, your day-to-day -day life. There's some lessons that I learned along the way and Tracy's put on a link uh, to a website, which again is really, is really useful. But I sent Tracy a Word document, which is, if I'd had that at the beginning, it goes through the 48 page document in real detail and talks about the descriptors in the PIP document. So for example, there's one about medication and I just put, yeah, I have alarms. Um, uh, and I just thought, well, I have alarms, so therefore I should get some help with it. No, it talks about just because you have an alarm doesn't mean I remember to take it. Mine are soluble tablets because I have a rea reaction to tablets. So I'll put them in a glass, I'll walk away, and then I might not go, ba go back to them. So it's about understanding each descriptor and what you get scored for. I know Janet's online and she'll say that just because you can chop a carrot doesn't mean you can make a meal. And I think it's remembering those things when you're filling out the documents and when you're being assessed. That just because you can get dressed, for example, doesn't mean you remember to get dressed or you remember what to put on. Um, having a shower, I am still not allowed to shower or bathe without somebody being here because I could drown. Um, my children are teenagers, so it's not appropriate for them to be in the house while I'm having a shower if my husband's not around. So it's just thinking about all the descriptors in the document of how it impacts into your life. And I think if I'd had that at the beginning, it makes it clearer about what we were like before and what we're allowed, what we're like now. And if Tracy does share the document, don't read it all, just go to the back. The appendices are really good about filling out your form, the evidence that you need, and the diary. I don't know if people write diaries. I, I was advised to write a diary, but there's a, again, there's a template at the back of the document that clearly outlines an activity, what it does to you, does it make you fatigue, um, the impact again on your life, and it just helps with going back, because mine's, mine's gonna be a year on since I appealed, you forget what things are happening, the diary I find is also good for your appointments because I don't know about anybody else. I've seen my neurologist once. Um, and again, in between those appointments, just remember it, those worst days that we have. And people say to me, oh, you're ha are you having a normal day today, Catherine? Yeah, but my normal is not my normal I had before. And I think it's just remembering what our new normal is, and I know everyone talks about that with the COVID, but what is your new normal and what do you need to be able to function every day?
So that was it really in a nutshell. 